Okay. Welcome to this week's Grow Permaculture presentation. This week's presenter is Diane Willis. She's a botanist and a permaculturist. She will share some helpful tips that may support your immune system to better deal with cold and flu viruses. She will explain the various stages of infection and what to do at each stage using food, herbs and other remedies. She will also talk about plants to grow in Central Florida that can be useful in supporting your immune system. Please note, this presentation does not purport to give any medical advice. It offers educational information only. We urge people to use due diligence and consult with their chosen medical professional about any medical matter, including COVID-19. Here is Diane Willis. Thank you, Steve. I'm gonna start with a disclaimer. I am not a medical practitioner. I am a botanist, actually a wetland scientist by profession and a permaculturist who has learned about home remedies and local herbs by going to see a professional herbalist, Rose Galagian, who lives in Wesley Chapel in Florida. I met her on an annual herb walk, which she holds on her property every April. She also does consultations and sells many kinds of dried herbs and herbal products. In fact, that's when I became interested in her because I saw her wall of dried herbs and I recognized half of them as a botanist uh, as growing here. So that intrigued me. Rose's website is imherbalist.com. I learned a lot from Rose the internet and going to herb conferences, which they have every year in Florida. I've tried many of these remedies on myself and find that they work for me to shorten the duration and severity of illness. I wanted to share what I have learned because of the COVID-19 pandemic. There has been a lot of information on how to keep from getting infected and how to keep others from getting infected if you have COVID-19, but very little on what to do to help yourself get through an infection. My goal is to help people learn to support their immune systems, to help keep respiratory viral infections from becoming severe. This is a very detailed talk, and it's meant to be a reference guide to, for you to look things up when you get ill or you think you might be getting sick. It's also good for colds, flu, or COVID. We will be distributing a PDF of this talk after it's finished so you don't have to be madly writing notes we will be distributing it but i welcome any questions or comments or, or suggestions and we'll have a q a at the end if you get sick with the virus during the pandemic as the coronavirus outbreak progresses experts say it's increasingly likely you might get the new illness the cdc's recommendations if you get sick are to stay at home, monitor your symptoms, rest, and stay hydrated. During an outbreak, if everyone with a cold floods their local emergency rooms, it will be harder for healthcare workers to treat patients who are critically ill. Plus, you could pick up the virus in the hospital if you don't already have it. The CDC website said on July 21st, 2020, that there was currently no specific antiviral medication recommended to treat COVID-19. Treatment in the hospital is directed at relieving symptoms and providing oxygen if needed. So your best defense is your own immune system, which was always your best defense. So I'll start out by explaining what a virus is. It is basically genetic material surrounded by a protein and fat coating. Uh, there's debate whether it's really considered alive. It doesn't do things that living things do, like eat or produce waste or breathe um, or reproduce itself. It has to use host cells to reproduce. It cannot do it on its own. There are millions of species of virus. They infect all life forms, animals, plants, and bacteria. And scientists speculate that viruses are an ancient life, life form that existed when there were only bacteria on the earth. Different species of viruses have different ways of spreading. 
Some spread through insects or mosquitoes and they infect the blood. Examples would be the Zika virus, West Nile, or malaria. They are in food and water and they can infect the digestive tract. They can be transmitted through sex, like HIV. Um, or they can be transmitted through the air, and the, that is the coronavirus family of viruses. And they infect the lungs. Um, colds and influenza are all in this family. MERS and SARS uh, were outbreaks of this kind of virus. So MERS stands for Middle East Respiratory Syndrome and SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. And then there's the newest outbreak, which is COVID-19, which I think is most closely related to the SARS virus. So this picture shows that um, basically here's the protein and fat coat with uh, genetic material inside. And the spikes are what it uses to uh, get into the host cells. How does a coronavirus infect a host? It's inhaled through the nose and mouth, sometimes gets in through the eyes. It lodges in the mucus lining of the nose and throat. It penetrates the surface cells of the linings. The virus replicates or makes the cells replicate itself until it fills the cells. The cells die and burst open, spreading the virus. If swallowed, the virus can infect cells in the gut. In moderate to severe cases, the virus works its way deep into the lungs where it infects tiny air sacs where oxygen exchange takes place right there. The body's response. When something damages your cells, your body releases chemicals called cytokines that trigger a response from your immune system. This response includes increased blood flow with white blood cells to the damaged area, a process called inflammation. Acute inflammation often causes noticeable symptoms such as pain, redness, or swelling, like a sore throat. This is very important to know. So if you get a sore throat, it's not the virus doing that. It's your body doing that in its efforts to fight the virus. White blood cells engulf, kill, and digest foreign bodies and cellular debris. They also create antibodies. Uh, this is a picture of a white blood cell engulfing a virus. Pretty grotesque, I think. So, White blood cells produce antibodies, and antibodies are proteins that are made to attach to and neutralize or destroy foreign substances in your body. How viruses enter cells and how antibodies stop them. So on the left, you see the virus is here, and you see the genetic material inside the protein coat and the spikes. It uses the spikes to attach to host cells and it attaches to receptors on the host cell. And then it tells the receptors to let the virus into the cell. Once inside the cell, the virus uh, deposits its genetic material and the genetic material instructs the cell to make copies of the virus. So how antibodies work is they are proteins that attach to that, the spikes on the virus and prevent it from attaching to the host cells. If a virus can't get inside a cell, it cannot reproduce. Your best defense is your own immune system. Keep it healthy. Quit smoking, it damages your throat and lungs. Eat a healthy diet to nourish your immune system. Avoid sugar, alcohol, and processed foods. Uh, they create inflammation in your body and there is stress on your body and they're not real food. Eat raw local honey as a sugar substitute. Uh, it has beneficial minerals and antimicrobial activity as well. So everybody says stay hydrated. That's important. But how much is enough? It's not one size fits all. It depends on your body weight. So there is a simple formula. Drink half your body weight per day in ounces. 
So for example, if I weigh 100 pounds, I would drink 50 ounces a day. 50 ounces divided by eight ounces per cup would equal six cups per day. Eat lots of fruits and vegetables, preferably organic. Juicing and making smoothies is a great way to up your intake of fresh raw fruits and vegetables. Cook soups and stews with lots of onion, garlic, ginger, turmeric, and herbs like thyme, rosemary, sage, oregano, the Italian herbs, and coriander and cardamom, the Asian herbs. These have um, beneficial nutrients and antimicrobial properties, and they're a great food. Eat more probiotics and fermented foods, such as kombucha, kefir, sauerkraut, miso. They nourish your microflora in your gut, which are important in your immune system. Vitamin D supplements are important for the immune system health, and they're hard to get from diet alone, although you can get them from being in the sun. Cod liver oil is a natural source of vitamin D. So get enough rest, exercise, and fresh air. Manage stress. Meditation and deep breathing are good for managing stress. We typically breathe in and out only a fraction of our lungs capacity. Deep breathing has been shown to improve respiratory health and patient outcomes across a number of conditions. I recommend the four, seven, eight breath. That means breathe in for a count of four, hold for a count of seven, and breathe out for a count of eight. Dr. Weil has a very good video showing how to do that. Um, but it's always good just to breathe in and fill your whole lungs, hold it a bit, and breathe out and try and empty your lungs. What this does, that releases stagnant air, it brings in fresh air, and by the way, you want to do this in an area with fresh air, like not standing beside a roadside with um, auto fumes. And so doing this frequently throughout the day, whenever you think of it, is very good for keeping your lungs healthy and your immune system healthy. Your throat is your first line of defense. Keep it moist and well lubricated. Your throat is lined with mucus, which is sticky, so it can trap dust, allergens, and viruses. Mucus also contains enzymes and immune cells that kill or isolate pathogens. Sipping on liquids throughout the day can keep the mucus moist and help it flow down to the stomach where foreign particles can be digested by stomach acid. So most people, you know, think mucus is kind of gross, but uh, the herbalist will tell you mucus is your friend. Take care of your mucus membranes. If you have a dry or sore throat, you should drink teas with mucilage to soothe and coat the mucus membranes. And that's even if you have a dry throat, it doesn't have to be sore. Uh, teas that are contain mucilage, um, wireweed, which is in the hibiscus family, all the hibiscus family has mucilage. Uh, marshmallow root, that's one of the best. It doesn't grow here, but it's an ingredient in many of the herbal teas you can buy. Roselle, cranberry hibiscus, and Caesar weed are all in the hibiscus family. Caesar weed is a invasive species, but it's, a, um, it's in the hibiscus family. So my friend Rose uses the root instead of mar marshmallow root, which doesn't grow here. Pine needles have mucilage. You can also use cough drops or zinc lozenges to moisten your throat. Ricola is a good brand and it's good to carry around. You never know when you're gonna need it. Um, zinc lozenges, zinc is a micronutrient important in the immune system that's often lacking in the diet. So zinc lozenges are sold in the store to help reduce the severity of infections. Eat mucilage rich foods. Oatmeal is a good example. Chia seeds, flaxseed, okra in the hibiscus family is especially known for the mucilage. And then there's another yard weed called purslane. And I'm, I have info sheets at the end of this talk talking about um, some of the best um, herbs and um, plants to grow to, uh, for vitamins and to nourish your immune system and to help you through infections. So, and also there's Nopales cactus. 
Vitamin C acts as a scavenger for stray bacteria and viruses. So uh, if you are think you might be um, cold and flu season, or you might have been exposed to somebody, uh, 500 milligrams per day of vitamin C is helpful. Now in the pandemic, first thing that happened, all the store shelves were cleared of vitamin C and you couldn't get it anywhere, but you can get it from food. So um, moringa powder or um, raw moringa is rich in vitamin C. Citrus ju juice you knew about, but the citrus rinds are also rich in vitamin C. So a lot of times I'll take a microplane and grate off little pieces and put it in tea uh, of an orange or another citrus for it to get some more vitamin C. Other herbs are rose hips, guava leaves, loquat leaves, cranberry hibiscus, anything sour, fennel seed, pine needles, roselle, rosemary, or thyme teas. You can also breathe steam if the air is dry. Uh, you want to keep the humidity above 40%. This is a more of a problem up north where the air can get very dry. But even in the, in the winter, sometimes the air can get dry in Florida too. So what you would do, you would simmer a pot of water or in a crock pot with a few sprigs of rosemary or thyme and you let it fill the air with steam. You can use a steam humidifier or simply leave the bathroom door open after showering. If you think you might have been exposed to somebody who's sick or you feel under the weather, it's a good time to start up with antiviral herbs for prevention. Probably not, you shouldn't use all the time, but if you feel like you've been exposed and you wanna ramp up your immune response, these are good teas, elderberry, which you should never eat raw because it causes nausea. Um, there, it stimulates the immune system. So uh, there's some argument that maybe it might overstimulate the immune system. So um, there's a debate among herbalists. To, so to be on the safe side, just discontinue when you, the symptoms start, you start to get a fever, but it's very good for prevention. It's been shown to keep the viruses from getting in your cells. Echinacea is also very good, but not if you have high blood pressure. Other good herbs are astrolagus, thyme, ginger, lemon balm, or reishi mushrooms. Other mushrooms are good. I just didn't have the room to put all of them here, but you just go look them up, mushrooms that are good for uh, influenza, and you get a whole bunch of um, references. Oh, by the way, I put the references on the bottom for all of my slides so you can look them up for more information. So if you're gonna make your own herbal teas, it's good to have a guide on how to do it. Rules, as it were. So uh, for dried herbs, one teaspoon per cup of water. For fresh herbs, you need more, one tablespoon per cup of water. The leaves and flowers are relatively fragile and um, they should be steeped in boiling water, which is called an infusion. You bring the water to a boil, you turn off the heat, you add the herbs, steep them at least five minutes, strain them out, and drink hot or cold. Stems, barks, and roots uh, should be boiled because they're tougher material. Grate or cut the herbs into small pieces, add to cold water, turn the heat up to boiling, and simmer for 15 minutes. Then steep five minutes or overnight and strain out the herbs. So with the lack of testing, uh, and it might be hard to get a test, you might, there's still allergies around, there's still other influenza strains. So it would be useful to know, is it allergies, flu, or coronavirus? And there's certain clues that you can use. Allergies are, um, typically are runny nose and itchy eyes. Those are the de defining symptoms. The symptoms come on gradually, usually in the spring when there's a lot of pollen or allergens. There might be a cough, but it's from post-nasal drip, which is mucus draining down, down the back of your throat. There could also be a lot of sneezing, headaches, and red, itchy, or puffy eyes. 
with the flu, body aches and headaches are common. The symptoms start suddenly. This in comparison to the coronavirus, which begins slower than the flu, most likely because your body's ex been exposed to influenza strains before and recognizes them sooner. Whereas the coronavirus is new to the human race and it takes a while for the body to cue in that there's something wrong. So the flu often starts out with a sore throat and sometimes the throat can get very sore. And runny or stuffy nose and fatigue are common as well as fever and chills. Um, there is a cough. Uh, often though, this is a wet cough which means when you cough, you feel the congestion move in your throat and you often bring up congestion or blow it out your nose. So coronavirus begins slower than the flu. It may begin with a loss of smell. The majority of people start with a high fever, 88% according to the World Health Organization report listed below as a source. Other symptoms vary and include fatigue, sputum, which is coughed up mucus, sore throat, muscle aches, and headaches. So while flu might give you coughing and congestion, it rarely causes shortness of breath when you feel like you can't get oxygen or have pressure in your chest. Coronavirus sometimes starts out with a loss of smell. Doctors say this is a relatively common side effect of upper respiratory infections. Changes in taste or smell are common for viral illnesses like the cold or the flu. Likely they are due to inflammation of the nasal passages and associated infection of the nasal nerve cells responsible for smell. The sensation of not being able to taste is usually caused by a lack of smell. Smell and taste should return after symptoms subside. Similar symptoms were reported during the SARS outbreak in 2003. A team of British ear, nose, and throat doctors raised the possibility of a new indicator of the coronavirus, one they say has been observed globally, even in patients who are otherwise asymptomatic. Significant numbers of patients with proven COVID-19 infection develop loss of smell in South Korea, China, Iran, and Italy. More than two thirds of confirmed cases in Germany included loss of smell. In South Korea, where ample testing has been done, 30% of patients testing positive for COVID-19 have had loss of smell as their major symptom in otherwise mild cases. So not only should you monitor your throat and make sure it never gets dry, and maybe a dry throat might be the first symptom, you should monitor your sense of smell. And if you lose it, that could be a sign that uh, you might have contracted coronavirus, even if you feel fine otherwise. Coronavirus often starts out with a dry cough. A dry cough usually means the mucus is too dry and stuck and needs to be thinned and moistened to move foreign particles out of the body. Steams with antimicrobial decongestant herbs moisten and loosen stuck phlegm. Some examples are rosemary, thyme, sage, oregano, camphor tree, eucalyptus, mints, lavender, chamomile, and yarrow. Fresh or dried plants are better than essential oils, which can be caustic. Boil the water, add the herbs until it's fragrant, put the towel over your head, breathe deeply, and cough up any phlegm into tissues. I have used this method during influenza um, illness, and it has shortened the duration by about half because what this does, it congeals the mucus so that you can cough it up and get rid of it. So your body is cleaning out quicker. Also good for a dry cough are demulcent herbal teas that moisten mucous membranes, like wireweed, marshmallow, fenugreek, chickweed, violets, and plantain. Licorice is also antiviral, and it's an excellent demulcent. 
but do not use if you have heart problems. Slippery elm works very well, but it is becoming endangered. You used to be able to buy slippery elm lozenges in the health food store, and I used to like to carry them around, but you can't find them anymore, probably because slippery elm is becoming endangered. You can also use cough drops or zinc lozenges to soothe your throat and moisten it. Uh, one thing I noticed, they, the um, traditional medicinals and yogi make throat coat teas, which are very good blends for this, but they get bought out. Um, but nobody knows about licorice. So when I was looking for a throat coat tea, I saw that nobody bought the licorice and I was like, hey, yeah, great. Because it is one of the best antivirals and also a very good demulsion. What to do if you are sick. And this is using CDC guidance. If you have a fever or cough, stay home and isolate yourself if you have mild symptoms. Have good ventilation. Clean surfaces and wash clothing and sheets in hot water frequently to avoid re-exposure to virus particles that have been coughed or breathed out. Call your doctor for advice if symptoms worsen. And this is added because we don't test very well. It's up to us to notify others who were exposed to you that they also might catch corona and to isolate themselves because the government won't. If you are at higher risk of getting very sick, 65 or older, have underlying medical conditions like heart or lung disease or diabetes, or are immunocompromised, call your doctor right away. Call 911 right away if you have trouble breathing, persistent pain or pressure in the chest, bluish lips or face, or new confusion or inability to wake or stay awake. You can leave home after these three things have happened. You have had no fever for at least 72 hours, that is three full days, without using medicine that reduces fevers. Your other symptoms have improved, and there's been at least seven days since your symptoms first appeared. USA Today came up with this CND timeline. It's a guide, it's, it's not the ultimate truth, but um, so you get the infection and there are a couple days oftentimes where you have no symptoms. Um, oftentimes you may be somewhat infectious, but not too much. Once the virus starts getting in your cells and uh, replicating, then your symptoms start to appear typically uh, between two and five days with five days as an average, but up to 14 days. And then, um, you have what's called viral shedding, where when you breathe, or especially when you cough, there's virus in your cough droplets or your breath that can infect others. And um, so typically that's why they have the 14 day quarantine period. Strategies for fever. Fever happens when the body's internal thermostat raises the body temperature above its normal level. Turning up the heat is the body's way of fighting the germs that cause infections and make the body a less comfortable place for them. Traditionally, fevers weren't suppressed with anti-inflammatories like acetaminophen. Instead, remedies were given that move blood to the surface of the body, which facilitates sweating. The sweating results in a reduced body temperature and releases toxins. So the herbalists say you shouldn't use anti-inflammatories except if you really need them. For instance, sleep is super important. And if your symptoms are keeping you awake, it would probably be a good idea to take an anti-inflammatory like acetaminophen. But don't use it just to keep the fever down to keep you comfortable because you want the fever to do its job. And if you keep interfering with it and cutting it short, the fever will keep coming back. So, and also if you sweat, make sure and change your sheets and your clothing because the sweat will contain virus. 
Strategy for mild fevers between 100.4 and 102 degrees Fahrenheit. But they're also finding that a uh, temperature of 99 degrees could indicate a mild fever. Um, also, you want to know if the fever is 102 degrees Fahrenheit for more than three days or greater than 102 degrees Fahrenheit, call a doctor because the fever is getting severe and you'll want the doctor's advice. So strategies for mild fevers include a warm bath or shower, bundling up in blankets, and the reason for this is you're helping the body to reach the internal temperature it's going for. Oftentimes, fevers are accompanied by chills, and what that is, your body is trying to uh, induce um, shivering to bring its temperature up. So you can reduce the incidence of chills if you just help your body by warming up. Drink lots of fluids, preferably herbal teas, especially ones that contain herbs that promote peripheral blood flow like elderflower, wireweed, catnip, peppermint, and spearmint, or are antiviral like Chinese skullcap, thyme, and lemon balm. Use honey to sweeten the teas and electrolyte power, powder, electrolyte powder um, to restore your electrolytes. Now, um, some websites recommend Gatorade, but I don't favor that because Gatorade is just full of processed sugars. They do sell electrolyte powders in the grocery store that have very little sugar with the electrolytes, and they also have extra vitamin C. Another way to restore your electrolytes is to use a good quality sea salt. And the best way to ingest that is to have chicken broth, box chicken broth of a good quality is good, and um, put some sea salt in it and use it. Um, it's also, chicken soup has been called um, the Jewish penicillin. It's just very, very good for colds and flu. So rest and let the fever run its course. Strategies for headaches and muscle aches that often accompany, accompany fever. Your body may ache because the immune system sends white blood cells to fight the infection, which results in inflammation, which can leave the muscles in the body feeling achy and stiff. Strategies for headaches. Cool, damp washcloths on the forehead and back of the neck. Drink a strong cup of green tea. Strategies for muscle aches. Keep hydrated with water, vegetable or bone broths, and herbal tea. Keep warm. Take warm baths and showers. Use a heating pad. Gentle movement and stretch stretching help to flush out the toxins. Two milliliter tincture of bone set or kudzu, or a cup of chamomile or lemon balm tea. Definition of congestion. Congestion happens when the membranes lining your nasal passages become inflamed and irritated. They may make more mucus to flush out whatever caused the irritation. The immune system produces white blood cells which engulf bacteria and other cells containing viruses. The dead white blood cells and other cellular debris end up in the mucus, causing it to thicken and turn yellow. This is waste material and must be disposed of by nose blowing, coughing, and swallowing. In milder cases, the body's immune system is able to contain the virus in the upper respiratory tract. In severe cases, the virus makes its way down the windpipe and into the lungs, where it seems to prefer growing and may cause pneumonia. Strategies for congestion. Limit mucus producing foods, dairy, sugar, and wheat. Try to get as much mucus as possible out through your nose or by coughing it up. Boil water, add camphor tree leaves, which are the best, or pine needle, sage, or mint, and breathe the steam with a towel over your head to make the mucus easier to blow, up, blow out or cough up. Drink lots of fluids, especially herbal teas with fennel, ginger, mint, sage, or thyme to thin the mucus. Eat raw leaves of Spanish needles, 
or a tincture made from them. I have an info sheet on this plant. It is not particularly antiviral. It is antibacterial, but the main benefit from it is that it is a tonic for your respiratory system. It tones the music, mucous membranes and helps heal them and helps reduce inflammation and clear out congestion. The best way to use it as, or is raw or as a tincture because if it's cooked or dried, it loses some of its medicinal properties. So there's an info sheet with um, recipes at the back of this talk. Now we are going to be distributing this talk as a PDF. It's meant to be a guide. There's no way you're gonna remember all this stuff. So for congestion, prop yourself up when lying down. This is to keep your head from becoming clogged so that you can't breathe. Um, mild exercise, yoga, stretching, walking, but not enough to tire you out. Drink herbal teas to support your lymph system, which cleans out toxins. Try hydrotherapy and call 911 if you have shortness of breath or chest pain as you may have pneumonia. Hydrotherapy for fever and congestion. Hydrotherapy is the use of water, both internally and externally, and at varying temperatures to improve health. Hydrotherapy is very effective when used twice daily, as soon as possible after one recognizes the onset of symptoms, and thereafter until the fever is gone. During the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918, very few people who were treated with hydrotherapy succumbed to death. And I believe about half the people who contracted the Spanish flu died. It was very virulent. The um, sources at the bottom go into more detail about this. So alternating hot and cold water is thought to decrease inflammation and stimulate circulation and lymphatic drainage. So what you would do is take a 10 minute hot shower followed by 30 seconds of cold water, not icy cold, to finish off or soak in a tub of hot water, then quickly rub the skin with a cold washcloth. Afterwards, rest in a warm bed in a well-ventilated room. The reason for the hot water is because it opens up your lungs, it just opens up your body and uh, opens up your blood vessels and lymph system. The cold water will cause the blood vessels at the surface of your skin to contract and push the heat inward so the effects of the heat therapy last longer. What is the lymph system? It's an extensive network of vessels. It drains fluid from between the cells. The vessels branch through junctions called lymph nodes. So in this picture, notice that they're the circles, those are lymph nodes. They're throughout the body, they're in your, especially in your armpits and also in your throat. Um, in the lymph nodes, white blood cells attack viruses and bacteria. The lymph nodes swell in response to infection due to a buildup of fluid, dead viruses, bacteria, and white blood cells. So that causes them to swell. And so if a doctor is feeling your throat, he's looking for swollen lymph nodes, which would be an indication that your body is fighting an infection. So the lymph fluid drains into the blood where it's filtered by the liver and waste goes to the intestines to be eliminated. Lymph fluid is not pumped, but squeezed through the vessels when we use our muscles. The lymph system can stop working properly if nodes and vessels become blocked, infected, or inflamed. This can make an infection linger on. Strategies to support the lymph system and the elimination of waste. Move. Movement causes lymph fluid to flow. So don't just lay on the couch or in bed for hours and hours. Try and get up and move around periodically. Try stretching, walking, mild exercise, but not something that's gonna wear you out. Avoid foods that cause blockages, processed foods, sugar, conventionally raised meat, 
artificial sweeteners, dairy, soy, or table salt. Use sea salt instead. Use herbal teas or tinctures that support the lymph system. Calendula, burdock, yellow dock, violet, red clover, chickweed, and Tulsi tea is very good. Um, Organic India makes a very good Tulsi tea and it's been shown to really help clean out the um, lymph system and clean out toxins and help the body deal with the stress of an infection. Um, and it's also been shown by recent experiments to be antiviral against corona. The Organic India is the best brand and they make different blends for different uh, symptoms. So it's always good to have this on hand. Tulsi will grow in Florida. I've got an info sheet on it at the end. So drink lots of fluids, try hydrotherapy, breathe deeply and avoid wearing tight clothes. What is pneumonia? Pneumonia is a lung infection that causes the air sacs in your lungs called alveoli to fill with fluid or pus. That can cause shortness of breath because it is harder for you to breathe in enough oxygen to reach your bloodstream. When pneumonia occurs, the thin layer of alveolar cells is damaged by the virus. The body reacts by sending immune cells to the lungs to fight it off. That results in the linings becoming thicker than normal. As they thicken more and more, they choke off the little air pockets, which are what you need to get oxygen to your blood. A great deal of chest congestion builds up that is very painful. The mucus is often unable to make its way out of the air passageways. At this point, you should be seeking medical help. So this shows what pneumonia does. On the left, you have healthy air sacs. Um, notice that they're open, the passageways are open so the air can flow, and the little air sacs are open uh, for air exchange to take place. If you get inflammation, the cell walls cause the um, openings to constrict and restricts airflow. And inflammation inflames the cell walls and, and cause them to, come, to become tougher and thicker. And Air spaces will become filled with fluid, white blood cells, mucus, and the detritus of destroyed lung cells. Afterwards, all the sim symptoms have subsided. Um, it's important not to go back too quickly to your normal routine because your immune system is tired after all that work and needs to be built back up to avoid a relapse or secondary infection and relapses or a secondary infection seem to be common with the COVID. Strategies are the same as prevention. Eat a healthy diet to nourish your immune system. Avoid processed sugars. Eat raw local honey instead. Eat lots of fruits and vegetables, preferably organic. Eat easy to digest soups and stews with lots of veggies. Probiotics and fermented foods to restore your gut flora. Lots of rest. Drink lots of fluids, preferably herbal teas. Moderate exercise, keep moving. And this would be a good time to restock your supply of zinc lozenges, demulcent and antiviral teas, chicken soup, and two weeks worth of food and medicine for the next viral infection. Because when it happens, the stores clear out really fast. And it will happen again. You're gonna have influenza, you're gonna have colds, and you, there's probably going to be a second wave of the coronavirus. So let your immune system build back up. So here I have medicinal plants to treat colds and flu that will grow in Central Florida. And I'm just going to talk about them real quick. We're going to be distributing this uh, as a PDF so you can use it as a reference. It was my goal to have this as a reference for people so if they start to get sick, they can like page through and go, okay, what are my symptoms now? What do I do now? Um, in the past week, I've been using it for my brother who just caught COVID and uh, it's been extremely useful. He'll tell me his symptoms 
and then I'll go look it up and I'll go, okay, you need to do this, this, and this. So it works folks. And I want you to have this um, on hand as a reference. So you probably want to start growing um, plants that you can use on your own instead of having to buy from the store um, vitamins and medicine. So, so these are some of the best that I know of. Spineless cactus, so easy to grow. Uh, and it grows well in Florida. And it provides lots of food. Um, it is very nutritious, high in omega-3, rich in fiber and vitamin C, and contains mucilage for healthy mucous membranes. So on each of these info sheets, I have the requirements for growing them, the parts used, the medicinal properties, and how to use them. So even though there's no big thorns, there are tiny little thorns, so you should harvest this with gloves or tongs and uh, scrub off the remaining uh, little thorn hairs with a scrubby under running water. You don't have to peel the younger pads. You can use them instead of bell pepper in recipes or in salads or salsa or smoothies. On slightly older pads, you can add to soups, stews, beans and casseroles or eggs. Um, and look for Mexican recipes. This is one of their staples and there's some really good recipes for that. Camphor tree. This is really good for if you don't have Vicks Vapor Rub and you want something like it. Uh, it's a landscape tree. It's a very large tree, say the lower right. Um, and it's grown everywhere in landscapes. In fact, when I I want to do an herbal steam. I'll just walk down to the end of the street. Oh, there's one out at the end of the street. Grab some old leaves, um, you know, crush them into the boiling water to do the steam. It's very good at breaking up congestion, causing the mucus to congeal. But it is not to be taken internally. This is just for breathing, the steam. Cranberry hibiscus. So easy to grow. Once you have established it, it will die back in the winter, but reseed itself by itself uh, the next spring. Uh, very high in vitamin C, and it's anything that's sour should be high in vitamin C. It's also mucilaginous and soothing to a sore throat. Best way to use it is raw in salads, mixed with other greens, because it's a bit strong on its own. Or you can cook it as a green. Um, it doesn't make the best tasting tea, but you can use it in tea blends. So a nice natural source of um, vitamin C in mucilage. And down at the bottom of these, I have the source where I got this if you want more information. Oregano is a very good antimicrobial herb. Um, the European oregano only does well in the cold, se cold season in Florida. I prefer the Cuban oregano, which do, does well most of the year and throughout the um, rainy, summer hot rainy season if it's growing in part shade. So oregano is anti-inflammatory. It treats sore throat, coughs, and nasal congestion. And it's used to treat malaria, bronchitis, asthma, and colic in India, and colds and flu in Cambodia. It's also a very good herb for flavoring any Italian dish, um, soups, sauces, beans, meat. It makes a very good pesto or you can mix it half and half with basil. Um, it, has, it has a very strong flavor so you don't need much. And it grows very well. You can cut off a leaf and stick it in soil. Elderberry. We've talked about this. It's native to Florida. But what it likes is deep muck soil. It doesn't like too much, it doesn't like too much standing water or for very long, but it loves to have its roots in saturated soil. So that's why it likes muck soil. If you've got a lakefront, um, you can dig a swale in front of it and fill it with um, compost. Um, I, I live on the ridge and um, I hired somebody to dig a big hole and line it with plastic and I just made a sheet mulch bed in the ground and I have an elderberry there that is growing 
extremely well. <laughs> so it, that's what you need to do if you want to grow it. Um, so the berries are what's usually used um, and it's very good against viruses, but the flowers are also very good against fevers. Um, the leaves and the rest of the plant, plant, most sources say you should not take that internally. Some herbalists will make like preparations with this um, that are very strong, but I wouldn't attempt it at all unless I was a trained herbalist. Um, okay, so very good against viruses, keeps the viruses from entering cells, rich in vitamin C and antioxidants, reduces swelling in mucous membranes, lessens allergy symptoms, and stimulates the immune system. So it's not recommended when symptoms start or in people with autoimmune problems. Elderberry, the favorite way of using it is as a syrup. They do sell it in stores in cough drop. But uh, if you don't produce a lot, because it takes a lot to make syrup, um, the best way to use it is dried in a tea blend. And um, if you eat the berries raw, in a lot of people it causes nausea. Um, so that's why it should be cooked or dried. You only need to boil it five minutes. If you dry it and um, steep it and strain it out, the cyanide, cyanide, which causes nausea, is in the skin and the seeds, which don't make it into the tea. So that's my favorite way of using it. Fennel. Uh, it grows very well during the winter cool season. Uh, it's a nice celery substitute uh, and it has good um, medicinal properties. Um, it reduces spasms, reduces inflammation, anti-flatulent, rich in vitamin C, and the seeds help break up congestion. So the way you use this, uh, you use the basis like you would celery and raw or in um, cooked foods. The stems are too fibery to eat, but you can cut them up and fish them out of the soup later and it'll flavor the soups. You can make tea with the leaves, but unless you have bronze fennel, it's not very tasty. And it's good to let some of your plants go to seed because the seed is very beneficial. It's good for digestion if you eat it after meals. And the seed tea is a gargle for a sore throat. In fact, in Indian restaurants, they often have a bowl of fennel seeds for people to have a little bit to eat after they finish their meal. Garlic chives. Garlic is a very good herb for its antibacterial, antifungal, lowers fever, reduces blood pressure and cholesterol, and clears out congestion. However, garlic doesn't grow real well in Florida. Um, it does okay in the cold season, but dies out in the, um, the hot season. But garlic chives is a perennial, and if it smells like garlic, it has the same beneficial properties as garlic. And you, it, you can grow it throughout the year, and it's a perennial, so you don't have to pre replant it all the time. So in Florida, it's a good substitute for garlic. And you can use it fresh or cooked. Ginger. Ginger is one of the world's best antivirals, anti-inflammatory herbs. You use the root. Raw juice from the root is antiviral. Um, it's one of the best herbs for controlling nausea. Very effective. So um, it is a good tea to have around um, if you think you're gonna be prone to get nausea. Some, a minority of people do get uh, digestive sy uh, symptoms from the coronavirus that would cause nausea and vomiting and uh, ginger is very good for this. It clears congestion, improves digestion, stimulates circulation and relaxes spasms. Um, the best way to use this is the raw juice, but if you don't have a juicer, cut, it, cut up the garlic in pieces and boil it for 15 minutes to make tea. 
caution, it can be drying to mucous membranes, so you should not use it if you have a sore throat or a dry cough, or if you have ulcers or a high fever. However, if you mix it with a demulcent herb, then you can use it. So uh, demulcent herbs would be marshmallow root and or wireweed or things like that. Just be cautious if it's irritating to a dry throat um, then or your esophagus, then, then don't drink it. Moringa, vitamin in a tree, um, tree of life. Uh, it grows well in Florida. It will um, not do so well in the winter, but grows gangbusters in the summer. Very nutritious. The raw leaves are rich in vitamin C. It's often used as a dried powder instead of taking a vitamin pill. Um, you dry the leaves and make a powder. It's rich in protein, calcium, iron, and vitamins A and B. You use it instead of a pill. And the whole plant is edible and useful. Um, the flowers tend to be spicy, but you can use them in tea. Uh, good for livestock. The powdered seeds can purify water. And I have a video from Echo that shows how this is done. Um, you make a powder out of the dried seeds and it acts like, mix it with water and, and it acts like a flocculant to settle out the particles that carry bacteria and um, viruses and things. Pine needles, who knew? The whole tree is useful. If you check out Eat the Weeds, it'll tell you about other things in the needles. But the needles are good for breaking up congestion. They're rich in vitamin C. They soothe a sore throat. They're antiseptic and improve blood flow. You use the green needles, not the brown ones. Cut them in pieces, um, breathe the steam, and then you can drink, drink the liquid. One warning is that um, they do contain sap, which can stick to your pots. So you want to wash the pots as soon as, as soon as you're done with them. Purslane. This is another common yard weed that is extremely nutritious, high in omega-3s, probably the highest in the plant world, rich in vitamins A, B, C, and E. Um, they soothe a sore throat and they contain mucilage for healthy mucous membranes. And they're good to eat raw. Rosemary. Um, relaxes coughing spasms. It thins mucus formed during bronchitis and improves airflow. The aroma is calming for nervous tension and it is traditionally used to boost the immune and circulatory systems. So it's good to put in steams. You can put it in tea blends um, and you could drink it straight but uh, it's nice to br um, blend it with something lemony. And of course, use it in cooking, all kinds of cooking. Uh, you can make an alcohol tincture with it, but avoid in high doses if pregnant. Roselle, Jamaican sorrel, it's in the hibiscus family, very high in vitamin C. And it lowers fevers and improves digestion. The, um, these are the outer coverings of the flower, not the flower itself. And they're bright red. Um, it makes a wonderful drink. Um, you just boil the flower bases whole, or you can draw, pull them apart and dry them. Um, you can make a sauce or a jam, but they're so fibery, you have to fish them out and make jelly. Sage. Um, it grows well here during the, co the cooler, cooler season, but you might need to plant, replant it every year. Um, relieve sore throats, antibacterial, anti-inflammatory, and um, it can be used as an alcohol extract, but you have to be careful with it. But as a tea, you can use it all as much as you want, and it makes a good gargle. And when cooked with beans, it, help, it helps prevent gas. Spanish needles. This is a very important weed and people hate this weed and they try and get rid of it, but it's the best medicine and food and could be very important in treating the coronavirus 
So I would say value this weed. It's everywhere, I guarantee, it's probably in your yard. The way to recognize it is it has opposite leaves that uh, the number of leaflets are one to five uh, with teeth on them, very prominent teeth and a square stem. But you want to see it bloom and go to seed to be sure you know what you have. It has an aster flower, it's in the aster family, with yellow disc flowers and white petals that are not evenly spaced. And the seeds have are like a, a needle with two hooks that hooks to your pants, which is why people hate it. Um, so that's how you know you have Spanish needles. Um, you want to be careful where you harvest it because it uptakes heavy metals. Um, the, it's not really antiviral. It is strongly antimicrobial, but the important effect is it protects and heals mucous membranes, including the cilia in the lungs. The cilia are hair cells that help move mucus up out of the lungs so it doesn't get stuck there. It tightens, shrinks, and tonifies the structural cells of mucous membranes, thereby preventing congestion, and it soothes inflamed respiratory passages. So there's a warning here about blood glucose and insulin levels. The best way to use it is raw. Um, you can eat it fresh. It doesn't really taste very good, in my opinion. Some people like it. Um, but you can put it in a smoothie and you don't even taste it. Uh, for quick effect, chew on the leaves and hold it in your cheek. And I have seen it stop asthma attacks. Um, and somebody was having problems with allergies and he chewed on it for about 15 minutes and it cleared up his head. It's not always in the best, it grows all year, but it's not always in the best condition. So it's good when you have a bunch to make an alcohol tincture uh, so that it keeps the alcohol tincture is also very effective. Um, and the recipe is right here. And also the amount to take as a preventative and also for acute conditions. Thyme is um, a very nice herb to have. And it, it does well during the um, winter cool season. Uh, it might not last through the summer. It is one of the best antimicrobials, antivirals. They use thyme oil to make natural antiseptic wipes that are like 99% effective. Um, it relaxes spasms, controls dry coughs, helps clear bronchial mucus, and improves digestions. So you can use it raw or make a tea or a tea blend. Um, the essential oil is very strong and should not be taken in high doses for long periods of time. It's always better to use the fresh or the dried herb or a tincture made from it. Tulsi basil, also called holy basil. It's from India, highly revered herb. It is basil, but it's a shrub. It's a low shrub, maybe gets to about five feet tall. It does grow well here, um, especially if it's in part shade. Um, the, so the leaves are demulcent, antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal. Immunomodulator, it helps the, modulate the immune system so that it responds appropriately to an infection. So it stimulates it when there's a new threat and it calms it down if it's overreacting to a threat. Uh, Tulsi lowers fever, warms and causes sweat reduces congestion in the nose and lungs, and very importantly, moves waste through the lymph system and helps the body with stress. It's best in a tea. It may cause um, gastric distress in some people, usually not, but if it does, just lower the dose. It makes a really nice pesto, so um, it doesn't dry well, so you could use it as pesto. Wireweed, also called fan petals, also called that damn weed. It's everywhere and can survive being mowed constantly. It's super tough. 
any the and it's in the hibiscus family. The genus is Ceta, and any um, species in this genus has the same properties. Um, but the ones you're going to run into most often are Ceta ulmifolia or Ceta acuta. Those are two names for the same plant because sometimes um, botanists change the name of stuff if they find out new information. So the um, the bigger picture with the plants um, in flower with the bee on it um, with the teardrop shaped leaves, that's Ceta acuta. And another common Ceta is um, Ceta rhombifolia, which is this one right here and the leaves are more diamond shaped. It doesn't really matter the difference between them, but another way to tell them apart is the stalks on the flowers for Ceta acuta are short and the one, the stalks on the flowers for the Ceta rhombifolia are longer. Um, it's a low shrub. If you let it go, it will get to be a foot and a half tall. And all of the parts of this plant are beneficial. Um, it's antibacterial and antifungal, not so much antiviral. But where it comes in handy, it's a fever modulator, anti-inflammatory, good for pain, has mucilage. It protects the stomach lining, but most importantly, it's like a tonic for your circulatory system. And the coronavirus has been shown to cause, uh, in severe cases, or maybe not so severe, um, tiny little blood clots and to infect your circulatory system. So this plant is a good tonic for your circulatory system. Um, it increases red blood cell counts and total white blood cell counts and has been used effectively for long-term debilitating blood infections like Lyme and malaria. It's also a very good food, very high in protein, minerals, and vitamins. The leaves are very tough, so they should be put in a smoothie or cooked. And here is the recipe. The best way to use this is to make a decoction, um, a tea. So you would, you would use all parts of the plants, just cut the twigs off and snip them into water, um, a tablespoon per cup. Um, you want to add something acid because, like lemon juice, because the acid pulls out more of the beneficial chemicals. So you boil it for 15 minutes and, um, you know, you just put it in a mason jar and let it steep and then just drain it before you drink it. Um, and this is very soothing to the, the throat. Um, I use it for acid reflux. It's very effective because it's antifungal and um, candida has been associated with acid reflux by causing gas. Um, and if you want to, the tea, you know, doesn't last more than a few days, but if you want to um, keep this plant, you can add grain alcohol to the tea one-to-one -to, -one to make a tincture. And the tincture is also very effective. So that is my talk. We will be distributing it to you as a PDF for you to use as a reference. It's a work in progress. So I welcome any questions, comments, or suggestions. Um, and I'll write them down tonight. If you think of something later, you can email me at homeremediesforvirus at yahoo.com. And I'd like to know if it helps you as well. Thank you.